Miriam Namazi is spokesperson of the One Law for All campaign against Sharia law in Britain. The ex council, or the council, the ex council, <laughs> <laughs> the Council of Ex Muslims of Britain and Equal Rights Now organization against women's discrimination in Iran. She works closely with Iran Solidarity, which she founded, and the International Committee Against Stoning on the Sakani Mohammadi Ashitani case, amongst others. I hope I said that right. Murdered it. Uh, I murdered it, good. She was, the <laughs> she was the 2005 winner of the National Secular Society's Secularist, Secularist of the Year and one of 40 Women of the Year selected by Elle Quebec. It's my pleasure to introduce all the way from London, England, Miriam Namazi. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I can't see anybody, which makes me feel more comfortable, I guess. It's, I feel like I'm talking to myself, as I often do. Um, thank you to uh, Bill for inviting me. It's really wonderful to be here. I've learned so much these past two days. I think it's mean, though, to put me right after Sam, who did such a brilliant job in, in entertaining you. But anyway, um, I'll try my best um, not to entertain you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be speaking about uh, free expression, multiculturalism, and political Islam. This is the second time in my life that I've used PowerPoint, so bear with me if it looks very childish and foolish, and if I'm take, you know, putting you, uh, going through all the wrong slides, but anyway. Um, the issue of free expression is clearly hugely important, and it's most important for people who live under Sharia law, Islamic laws, in the Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. There are countless examples of this. Um, Co the Kuwaiti parliament has just recently voted in favor of a legal amendment to uh, make blasphemy punishable by death um, after the arrest of a young man who tweeted on Muhammad and it was deemed to be blasphemous. You have, I know, you, you must know of this case of a 23-year-old Hamza Kashgari in Saudi Arabia who faces the death penalty potentially, potentially for blasphemy for tweeting an imaginary conversation with Muhammad and also saying uh, that women in Saudi Arabia cannot possibly go to hell because they already live in it. In April, two young Tunisians, and very often these are young people, two young Tunisians, one in absentia, was given a seven-year prison sentence for posting cartoons uh, of Muhammad on Facebook. Here's one such cartoon that we see on Facebook, uh, which is a, 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 speaking about uh, child marriages under Islam, which is, in effect, pedophilia. There's also the case of Alex Ahn. He's an Indonesian civil servant. He's 30. He's an atheist. Uh, Stuart talked about this on the first day. And he's in prison right now, facing trial again for merely saying on the Indonesian atheist Facebook page uh, that there is no such thing as a god. You know about Asya Bibi. She's been in prison for many years now. She is also facing the death penalty in Pakistan for blasphemy. And there's uh, this famous Egyptian comedian, um, um, Adel Imam, who also uh, has just been given a three-month three prison sentence sorry, in Egypt for one of his comedy routines, which was seen to be insulting to Islam. And there's a famous Egyptian author who said that this court ruling uh, takes Egypt back to the darkness of the Middle Ages and that it is an unimaginable crime of principle. And, and we know, yes, Jesus and Mo, we love them. You, you know about, uh, the, and this is something that we're facing all over um, North America, Europe, Australia, and elsewhere, outside of countries under Islamic laws, where there are more and more restrictions on what people can say, particularly regards Islam. If you've followed the news in Britain, for example, you know that there's a 17-year-old Rhys Morgan who was threatened with expulsion from his sixth form uh, college if he didn't take down a Jesus and Mo photo from his Facebook page. And there have been several atheist societies in London who have faced a lot of pressure 
from student unions of those universities for, for again, posting Jesus and Mo cartoons on their Facebook pages. Now, of course, um, sorry, too soon. None of this is new. I mean, uh, this is uh, basically something that is business as usual for the political Islamic movement, having fought against uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran and Islamism for 25 years now. I'm really getting old. Um, it, you know, the, the, the threats, the intimidations, the censorship, the, the, the violence uh, that surrounds this issue is part of their daily routine. Um, and, you know, this is something that I've come to face quite regularly over these years. Just to give you a Canadian example, in 2003, I, I've done refugee rights work for um, a, a very long time, and I was a member of the Canadian Council for Refugees, and uh, we, we were working with various organizations internationally dealing with refugee rights, and I was banned from that uh, group for posting an article of mine on Islam, political Islam and women's rights. And I was told that my article violated their um, race policies. And, and basically, if you look at one of their anti-racist policy, which says the article was not maintaining and or promoting an environment free of discrimination and bias by its wholesale condemnation of Islam and Muslims, and not demonstrating an acceptance of the equity of all faiths. And again, you see how Islam and Muslims and faiths are all bunched in together. My article said nothing about Muslims. It attacked Islamism, it, it attacked Islam. And this is something we see um, quite regularly. There's a wonderful Jesus and Mo cartoon about you know, these bogus accusations that are thrown at people who are opposing Islam and Islamism. I don't know if you can read it, but it says, Hi, I'm Jesus. Hi, and I'm Mo. And together, we're Jesus and Mo. And the audience asks, What are you going to do for us tonight, Jesus and Mo? And they say, Tonight, we're going to employ a combination of personal abuse, bogus accusations of racism, and threats of violence, both veiled and explicit. And the audience asks, Why? And they say, To promote peace, tolerance, and respect. And, and, you know, as I said, this is business as usual for Islamism, which is not about Muslims. It's, it's, it's a far-right political movement that has been wreaking havoc in the Middle East and North Africa for many decades prior to September 11th and July 7th in, in London. A majority of its victims have been Muslims, continue to be Muslims, or those who are labeled as such. And where Islamists have political power, they forgo all niceties about respect and not causing offense, and they imprison and murder anyone who disagrees with them and who transgresses their and offends their sensibilities. And despite this track record, this vile track record, it's absurd in my opinion that a fundamental debate on free expression and Islam in the West is framed within a context of racism and Islamophobia. Let me explain. Here's another uh, Jesus and Mo um, cartoon which, is, which says, if we want to live together peacefully in a multicultural society, we must ensure that everyone's fundamental beliefs are protected from attack and ridicule. I don't want my fundamental beliefs to be protected from attack or ridicule, thanks. An audience member says, please feel free to attack or ridicule them anytime you wish. And you've got Muhammad saying, racist. So, um, and let me explain this a little further. I mean, if you're criticizing Islam or the veil or Sharia law or the Islamic Republic of Iran in Iran or in Egypt or in Afghanistan, the debate isn't framed within the context of racism and Islamophobia. I remember once being on a panel discussion a few years back with a famous Syrian atheist called Sadiq al-Azm. And when we were speaking about Islam and what, what it's doing to our societies there, uh, the Swedish uh, audience basically accused us of racism. And Sadiq al-Azm, I remember him telling me, you know, he was scratching his head and saying, I've been in prison in Syria for being an atheist. I have been tortured. I've been, um, you know, uh, threatened. I've been called many things, but I have never been called this. 
And I had to explain to him that this is how things work here in the West. So, you know, if you accuse, um, if you, for example, speak out uh, against Islam or Islamism in Iran, you're not labeled a, ra a racist. You're labeled an apostate, a blasphemer, uh, someone who's corrupt, someone who's an enemy of God or an apostate. So if we take the example of Hamza Kashgari, the 23-year-old I spoke to you about from Saudi Arabia, when he tweets about Muhammad, he faces the death penalty for blasphemy or for apostasy. But that same Saudi government, when it's dealing with criticism of its human rights record at the UN Human Rights Commission, will say that a criticism of its policies are Islamophobic and racist. What I want to say is that Islamists and their apologists have coined the term Islamophobia. It's a political term used to scaremonger people into silence by deeming it racist to criticize anything related with Islam. And these bogus accusations of Islamophobia, of offense, in my opinion, they serve Islamism in the same way that Sharia law serves them when they have power. It helps to threaten intimidate any sort of, and stop any sort of criticism and, and, defense, and uh, dissent. In my opinion, charges in the West of offense and Islamophobia are equivalent to secular fatwas. It's a warning by the powers that be of what is acceptable and what is not, of what is sacred and cannot and must not be challenged. The devious thing about using offense to silence people is that it is subjective. Can you imagine if activists against racial apartheid or abolitionists were not able to speak out for fear of causing offense? And what about women in Iran having to stop the fight against compulsory veiling because of fear of causing offense? Clearly, we're not all necessarily offended by the same things. The religious are usually offended more often than not, and Islamists are offended all the time, all the time. And this is a great uh, cartoon about the Arab uprising, where people are out there calling for pov you know, against poverty, unemployment, for human rights, for education, bread, health care, and you've got the Islamists standing there shouting, no bikinis. The Islamists are offended if you're gay, if you're unveiled, if you leave Islam, if you listen to music, if you dance, if you have religiously unsanctioned sex, if you're a woman, if you want to shake hands with a member of the opposite sex, and on and on. By hiding behind the excuse of offense, Islamists and their apologists are basically saying that because it is deemed to be offensive, with the person who is offended making that judgment call, you must limit your right to free expression. And what's even more interesting is that not all offensive speech and expression is off limits. What offends me is not off limits, not that I want it to be. According to Sharia law, there must be two women for every man testifying because of the difference between a man and a woman's brain. In Iran, the law that stones people to death, that buries them up to their chest and stones them to death for adultery, it's, it's illegal if you use the wrong size of the stone. It's not illegal to stone someone to death, but to use a stone that's too small or too big in case you kill them too quickly or it takes too long and they get bored. It has to be just right. According to Islam, gay people are perversions, women are subhuman, children are on par with animals, and it is a criticism of Islam that is offensive? Really? And it's absurd how whenever you speak about Islam, there are countless prefects to admonish you. And it's not just their, the Islamists and their usual apologists that do this, but you'll hear it sometimes from atheists and, and humanists as well. Oh, you're being too provocative. You're being deliberately pro provocative. Why do you have to establish a council of ex-Muslims of Britain to publicly renounce Islam and say you are an atheist? Never mind that you need to do this to break the taboo that comes with renouncing Islam because it is punishable by death still in many countries. The Egyptian blogger and atheist Alia Magdal Mahdi should never have posted a nude photo of herself as a scream against misogyny. 
Nudity is offensive. Your colleague was threatened in London at a One Law for All rally because she had gone there to discuss Sharia law. Well, what do you expect when you discuss Sharia law? That's what the guard said at the meeting. And on and on. My question is, isn't it my right to free expression? May I choose how I do it? And you do it your way. Please don't barter away what is permissible to say on my behalf. And whether you like my form of expression or not is irrelevant, just as it's irrelevant as to what a, what a woman was wearing when she was raped. Defense of accommodating, polite and inoffensive free expression only aids and abets Islamism at the expense of those living under it, opposing it, or questioning it. And it unfairly puts the blame squarely on those who dare to dissent or refuse to comply because it implies that Islamists would only be able to accept dissent if you had phrased it more politely. Had we known that manners was all that was needed, we could have prevented the slaughter of an entire generation in Iran. Wrong. Wrong again. And deliberately or naively, whether out of pragmatism or other matters of self-interest, this poor defense of free expression, which is no defense at all, fails to recognize the realities of a medieval movement with political power that is spearheading what I call an Islamic inquisition and that is the cause of incalculable misery and barbarity. Despite this, it is the causing of offense that has come to mean being discriminatory and racist. The London student atheist groups who had posted the Jesus and Mo cartoons in several universities, they were ac accused from everything from harassment, intimidation, harm to the welfare of Muslim students, and criticizing Islam and Muhammad was seen to upset social harmony, inclusion, tolerance. People, citizens, don't matter anymore. It's all about the inclusion and respect of beliefs, however reactionary and misogynist. But there is a crucial difference between prejudice against a group of people and criticism of a set of beliefs. There are many reasons for why even among some atheists and secularists, there is a discomfort in the criticism of Islam that isn't there when it comes to Christianity. Partly, this has to do with the racism of lower expectations. We can handle offense. It's their culture, their religion. They can't. Imputing on innumerable people the sensibilities of a vile far-right movement, which is Islamism. Partly, it has to do with the climate of fear and intimidation that the Islamists have created, leading to censorship and self-censorship. Partly, it has to do with the belief that Islam is an oppressed religion bullied by U.S. imperialism, as if U.S.-led militarism and Islamism are not two sides of the very same coin. Partly, it has to do with multiculturalism, which gives identity politics supremacy at the expense of individuals within a constructed, homogeneous Muslim community, thereby portraying and legitimizing Islamist sensibilities as the offended sensibilities of all Muslims. In one debate uh, on, on the veil, there's a Muslim woman who writes, I am told an authentic Muslim woman is one who is in some form of hijab or veil. The rest, I suppose, are fakes or pretenders. Talk about stereotyping, and coming from feminists, this is alarming. Have you noticed how the authentic Muslim voice is always the most regressive? The problem with this perception is that it doesn't see all those people out there fighting against Islamism and Sharia law. It doesn't see the atheist in that community. It doesn't see the ex-Muslim, the free thinker, the secularist. The gay Muslim, the artist, the rapper, the campaigner. It doesn't see the countless people who are not offended by a Jesus and Mo cartoon, or the satanic verses for that matter. And it doesn't see the jokes and the 
harm that is poked against Islam that is far greater than anything a Jesus and Mo cartoon or the satanic verses can do. Right now, Shahin Najafi, he's an Iranian refugee in Germany, he's gone into hiding because of a rap he's done against Islam. There's so much of this going on, both from within Iran and outside of Iran, that we don't hear about often. And, and that's why the whole idea that this Islamist sensibilities represents Muslims and all Muslims is, is absurd. In fact, you will find no greater opposition against Islamism than from people who've actually lived under it. What the problem with this perspective is, it doesn't see the resistance, the dissent, the class politics, the social and progressive movements that are fighting against Islamism. And this is something both the far right and the postmodernist left do. I'm on the left myself. But there is a huge segment of the postmodernist left that is in bed with the Islamists and that has been working actively with them. And what they do, actually, they do the very same, very same thing. The far right will blame and scapegoat all Muslims and immigrants for Islamism's crimes, which actually has a lot more to do at its start with U.S. foreign policy than it did with immigrants. And the postmodernist left will defend Islamism because it deems it to represent all Muslims. And what both sides are doing are defending Islam and Islamism or rejecting it at the expense of real-life human beings. Respect, like offense, is another prescription for demarcating that which we are not allowed to question or challenge. As the late Iranian Marxist Mansur Hekmat said, people's beliefs are only respectable to themselves. Of course, human beings are worthy of the highest respect, but that does not mean that people's right to a belief means that they can't be offended and that we can't question it or we have, to we have to respect it, tolerate it, and deem it equal and equally valid. And it's interesting because when people speak about the right to a belief or religion, they forget that there is also a corresponding right to be free from religion and to be free to criticize religion. This is not just about free expression for atheists. Because even the religious, don't forget, don't do religion in only one way. My father's a Muslim and a strong supporter of secularism. A lot of women that I work with in the campaign against Sharia law are Muslims who are secularists. With regards to Islam, it's particularly difficult, though, for a lot of Muslims because of what I call the Islamic Inquisition and the fact that you're not allowed in many instances to pick and choose because they do threaten and intimidate anyone that transgresses their norms. This is, of course, not to say that racism doesn't exist. Of course it does, and of course we must fight it unequivocally. But staying silent on Islam and Islamism won't stop racism. It will only exacerbate it. It will leave countless people under the mercy and influence of Islamism separate and unequal. And it will also leave... It will also leave the field open to the far right to scapegoat Muslims and immigrants and blame them for Islamism's crimes. In my opinion, when you look at concepts of offense, of Islamophobia and respect, they are not there to protect Muslims from bigotry. They are there to protect Islam, which is why Islamism, Islamists often insist on blurring the distinction between Muslims, Islam, and Islamism, so that they can ensure that Islam stays off limits. But Islam is a belief system like any other. It cannot be off limits. It must be open to criticism and offense. Anything worth expressing will cause offense. Those who say that expression is offensive are only looking at it from their own self-interest within the context of offense. They aim to challenge those that want to change things in society. It's a means of control. It's a means of censorship, of limiting rights. Limiting free expression to that which is acceptable restricts the right to speak for those who need it most. Saying Islam and Islamism are off limits means first and foremost 
that victims and survivors of Islamism are not allowed to do one of the only things at their disposal in order to resist. It's telling people that they cannot oppose theocracies and religious laws and call for secularism in the Middle East and North Africa. It's telling people that they cannot call for one law for all and secularism. It's telling people that ex-Muslims don't have a right to break that taboo and come out in public and say that they have a right to be atheist and not to be threatened and killed for it. <clears throat> it's telling the likes of Egyptian blogger and atheist Alia Magdal Mahdi that she cannot post a nude photo as a scream against misogyny and that other women's rights campaigners do not have a right to defend her. It's telling people who need free expression the most that they must remain silent. Well, sorry, no can do. Progress in every era has always been linked to criticizing that which is taboo and deemed to be sacred. It's meant very often offending deeply held sensibilities, and that's very often religion. It's no different today. Our era's progress is intrinsically linked to a criticism of Islam and Islamism. How can we begin to imagine a world without Islam, without religion, no superstition, if we are not allowed to unequivocally, uncomprom uncompromisingly speak out against it in any way we want? I'm with math here. I'm in favor of militant, radical, uncompromising expression. Nothing has changed in history by accommodating barbarity, by tiptoeing around it, by appeasing it. It's changed by dealing with it head on. Education, ending discrimination and equality, things that we've talked about this weekend, are also important as a secularism, something we haven't talked about as much, and universalism. You know, these are not Western values. Whenever it comes to people's rights and freedoms, we hear that they're Western. I don't hear the Islamic Republic of Iran saying it doesn't want nuclear technology because it's a Western concept. But when it comes to human values, things that people have fought for and that belong to all of humanity, they suddenly become Western. The other thing that we need to push for is the dereligionization of society. And this is an idea that was brought up a decade ago by the Iranian Marxist Mansur Hekmat. And I'm going to end by, with him uh, because I do want to introduce him uh, to you as well, if you haven't heard about him. Um, he, he says, I don't just want secularism uh, as an atheist, but also society's conscious struggle against religion. In the same way, that a segment of society's resources are spent on fighting malaria and cholera, and conscious policies are made against misogyny, racism, child abuse. Some resources and energy ought to be allocated to dereligionization. By religion, of course, I mean the religious machinery and defined religions, and not religious thought or even belief in ancient or existing religions. I am an anti-religious person and want society to impose more limitations beyond mere secularism on organized religion and the religion industry. If the law requires religions to register as private foundations or profit-making companies, pay taxes, face inspection, and obey various laws, including labor laws, children's rights, laws controlling the prohibition of sexual discrimination, defamation, libel, incitement, as well as laws protecting animals, and if the religion industry was treated like the tobacco industry, only then would we approach a principled position on religion and the legal scope of its expression in society. Thank you.